Now, let me introduce our, our, our speaker tonight. Uh, it's Justin McKinney, uh, all the way from Ottawa, Canada. I see Bill Humber and Dave Matchett here. So we, we've got a, a crew of uh, Canadians uh, to, to give him support and the CPR. Uh, Justin's an active member of the 19th Century Committee, having presented at the Fred, contributed to uh, 19th century uh, uh, writings in the Baseball Research Journal, the Bio Project. He's also the, uh, listed as the chief researcher for Sabre's pictorial uh, uh, history committee. Recently, he also he tracked down uh, a full biographical data on a uh, 1895 one-game player, Billy Childress, as reported in a recent uh, biographical committee newsletter. So he's, he's been around uh, making contributions. Justin will have a, uh, a book coming out on the uh, Union Association to be published by McFarland. I believe it's scheduled for December, but sometimes those slip a month or so as they, they go along. But uh, you can uh, uh, put in a pre-order uh, right now. Uh, the title of the book is uh, Baseball's Union Association, The Short, Strange Life of a 19th Century Major League. Uh, Justin also uh, posts essays on, uh, as, he, as he puts it in the description in a blog, on dead ball players on the uh, site called uh, On uh, Baseball Obscura, uh, with emphasis on the bizarre, the scandalous, and the macabre. I can't wait for tonight's presentation. Uh, I will post that web address for those uh, on the uh, chat during the uh, uh, evening, if you wish to go take a look at that. Uh, and off we will go here. So tonight's talk is from Justin McKinney, the Union Association's 10 Biggest Mistakes. Justin, if you'll bring your slides up, we'll be ready to go. Sure. Uh, one moment here. And if you go to full screen, we'll be all set. Yeah, I'm just trying to get that up. My apologies. Sorry, I feel like a feel like an amateur. My apologies, guys. If you if you go down to the bottom, uh, yeah, you know, this the uh, screen, right. Right to the left, uh, uh, to the left of the ninety-two percent, or yeah, whatever. Yeah, that's my okay. apologies. Thank you. Okay. I, f I feel like a, a union association quality presenter right now. My apologies. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the kind of introduction, Bob, and thank you for the opportunity to both of you, uh, Peter and Bob, for uh, uh, the chance to speak here. So let's get right to it. So, for the background, the union association was formed in the fall of 1883. Um, the initial plan was to make an eight-team league. I guess major, minor wasn't really as much of a distinction in 1883, but the idea was to have four Eastern teams, four Western teams, and to go head-to-head -head with the American Association and the National League. Um, one of the key tenets was they were going to ignore the relatively newly established reserve rule. Um, and this all came sort of in the aftermath of the tripartite agreement, which had been signed by the American Association, the National League and the Northwestern League prior to the 1883 season, which sort of set in stone that, that teams would not take players from each other and sort of was designed to eliminate sort of contract strife and this sort of bidding war that had been going on. Uh, in the off season of uh, after 1882 and between the American Association and National League in particular. Um, this is also at a time when there's unprecedented kind of growth in the world of baseball. Uh, you essentially have um, every single league is expanding uh, and you have a proliferation of uh, major league teams and minor league teams. So to start the 1884 season, there were uh, 28 major league teams essentially between the National League the American Association, the Union Association, um, along with dozens of minor league teams. And for context, uh, there's currently 30 major league teams. So imagine how thin and stretched thin the, the player pool was uh, to start the season. So um, 
essentially, so the first mistake is timing. So timing is everything. So because the league formed in 1883 and it formed after the tri protein agreement, after the two leagues, the two major leagues had formed an alliance. Um, and so the U association they faced uh, united front with every uh, basically major league and minor league team and every minor league and major league opposed to their existence. And it also meant there were, there were a few cities left to put teams in um, because the American Association had kind of filled the void of all the Western kind of markets that the National League had ignored. And then also New York and Philadelphia had gone from having no teams in 1882 to now having two teams in each, of, each city in 1883 and then 1884. Um, and so essentially, both the National League and the American Association had the advantage of forming when there was a bunch of open markets that were viable and large enough to support major teams. The Union Association in forming in 1883, going in 1884, is essentially locked out of any new markets. And in the markets where they were looking at, the American Association expanded to put teams in Toledo and uh, Columbus and things like that. And then so there was just a real bad timing to try and do this, uh, to try and take on two major leagues. There's new, new markets. You're going in to places where there's often one or two teams already, and you have to find a way to compete. And so that's uh, A.G. Mills, nationally president, and American Association president, H.G. McKnight, who both kind of you know saw the Union Association sort of as a threat and maneuvered as such to respond to the threat. So that was you know, timing. That's kind of big mistake for uh, the association. So mistake number two, Altoona, really Altoona. Um, one of the issues is this lack of available markets meant that after, as February 1884 started, there were only six teams that had com committed to joining the Union Association for the coming year. So they wanted to do an eight team circuit for scheduling reasons. And so then they have to look to other places. So in this case, they went to Altoona. Um, why Altoona? Well, I mean, it's a tiny market, 16,000 people according to the 1880 census. Um, I doubt if it's much bigger now. Uh, and um, essentially like the main appeal for it was that it was a popular um, spot. It was a railroad hub that connected the East and the West. And so in 1883, the Altoona had fielded a minor league team and it was a common spot for exhibition games because major league teams traveling from east to west and vice versa would stop in Altoona, play games, local craft, local team, and then move on their merry way. And by all accounts, they were actually quite well, like attendance wise, in 1883, doing this exhibition circuit. Um, but the issue with Altoona ended up being that when they formed <laughs> to join, uh, to Field the team in the 1884 season, they initially had planned to join a minor league circuit and they signed players who were strictly minor leaguers. There was only one player with major league experience on the roster, and that was a guy named Jack Lilly, who was a very talented but really troubled player who was kind of on his last legs after having blown up opportunity after opportunity uh, in the majors. Um, and so they were strictly Bush League. And as a result, you know, they were badly overmatched and they folded within six weeks. So the season started April 17th and the last game was May 31st. And so, yeah, here's a picture of the 1883 uh, uh, squad, um, which actually featured a number of players who ended up playing on the 1884 squad. Um, but yeah, and yeah, they just were not ready to compete. And it really did a number on the reputation of the league because the Altoona club was so kind of ill thought of and so overwhelmed and overmatched on the field and off the field that sort of made the whole league kind of look like a ramshackle sort of amateur kind of hour. And so that brings us to number three, so A2, Lucas. Um, so the league wasn't founded by Henry V. Lucas, um, but he was the, he became president very shortly after joining the league and he ran the St. Louis club uh, and he stocked his club with a bunch of star players and essentially he took on the Union Association kind of as his kind of his project. Um, he was 
26 years old. He was a millionaire scion of a St. Louis railroad magnet. He was one of the richest families in the state of Missouri. Um, but he's a 26 year old guy with a million dollars in 1883, 1884 money. Like that's a lot of money for a young, young person. Um, and his personality is a bit impetuous. Uh, he doesn't seem to be in, especially trustworthy and reliable in that he'd often say one thing and do the other. He's very ambitious, but he's also quite a bit overconfident. Um, and even from the start of his joining the Union Association of this plan to put a team in St. Louis in the Union Association, there were rumors that he was trying to buy the Cleveland Club in the National League and move it to St. Louis. So even as he's trying to get this league off the ground, he's also sort of angling to join the National League. Um, so he's a big spender. He was he spent a lot of money on the league, spent a lot of money on his own club, on propping up other clubs, um, but he had ulterior motives. And it seems to be the tension of that he both wanted to have success in St. Louis with a baseball team to rival the St. Louis Brown Stockings and Chris Von, Vondre, uh, but also I think he was looking to join the National League. And so whether it was because the association was successful as a whole or just his squad, I don't think he cared. I think ultimately he wanted to um, end up in the National League. And so by fall, both Lucas and Cincinnati Union's owner, Justice Slaughter, were maneuvering to join the National League. Uh, Justice Slaughter had, was actually trying to also, you know, try and find a spot in the National League. There were rumors that uh, the Detroit Wolverines were going to fold. And again, that would create a spot for him in the National League along with Lucas. And ultimately, the owners put their trust in Lucas and Florida. Um, but, you know, Lucas in particular, he bailed on them in the winter of uh, 1884 into January 1885. And that's sort of what caused the league to collapse um, because ultimately he had one vision and the minute he had the opportunity to join the National League, he did it. Um, this picture of Henry Lucas and uh, Justice Loder. And there were four stars and scrubs. So um, even today, competitive balance is, a, is an issue in baseball. I'm a Baltimore Orioles fan. Thankfully this year has been pretty decent, but you know, in recent years, it's been pretty challenging. Um, and so it, it dates back to you know the early days of, of professional baseball, back to the National Association. So it's always been an issue. There's always been teams that are good and teams that are not good. Um, the question is, how do you ensure that there's everyone's sort of on a rough scale? That that how do you ensure that um, each team has some quality of play? How do you ensure that games are competitive? How do you ensure that there's a pennant race? Different things like that, and that's something the Union Association heads did not consider at all. Um, I'm not sure how you would even go about doing that, knowing what they knew in 1884 in terms of team construction and all that sort of stuff, but there wasn't really any plan to ensure there was competitive balance. Um, for example, I mentioned Altoona, they were a low level minor league team that got recruited to join the Union Association. St. Louis with Henry Lucas, they filled the team with major league regulars who had established themselves as stars in the National League and the American Association. Um, and then the Washington Nationals were basically a semi-pro club that had played HA3 as a semi-pro unit uh, locally. And they added some players, but ultimately they were not, you know, of major league quality or anything like that. And so you have all these different teams doing different things, building the rosters in different ways. Um, some planning to save as much money as possible, some willing to spend lots of money, but there wasn't any way to ensure that these teams were matched up meaningfully and and comp the competitive play was ensured and it was not um so as a result St. Louis dominated the standings we know they famously they won the pennant by about 30 games finished with the 94 and 19 record you know won the first 20 games like and as a result fan interest waned in certain markets um and there was no pennant race which you know typically is what keeps fans engaged in the later months of the season and many teams were hopelessly uncompetitive like we saw Altoona they folded not not just because of financial reasons, but they're also six and 21, I believe, by the end of May. And there's other teams who were equally bad um, or even worse as the season went along. And so there was just no, no competitive balance, no means of ensuring that each team had a certain amount of talent on it. Um, and as an example, we have Fred Dunlap, who at the time was the big coup by St. Louis signing, signed by uh, Henry Lucas. 
Uh, he was the highest paid player in baseball. He's the best second baseman in boss baseball. He was previously the best second base. He's called the king of second baseman at the time. Uh, and you have Tony Suck, who, yeah, he was a catcher for the Chicago Unions, but yeah, that's, yeah, it's a bit of a joke, but he was not a good ball player. And that's the disparity you had is you had players who were legit stars and you had players who were absolutely, you know, vastly underqualified to be playing professionally. So uh, this sub brings up another thing is that the Prince versus Poplar. So along with the competitive balance, there was a huge economic disparity. So Lucas was a millionaire um, and Altina was run by a local pharmacist. And, and essentially the way teams funded the operations in 1884 was you basically recruited locals to buy shares in the team. And hopefully that'd be enough to keep the team going, to pay players, to build the park, to, you know, pay money on road trips, buy uniforms, buy equipment, all that sort of stuff. Uh, but when you didn't have big money men behind the squad, there was very little chance for it to succeed. Um, and there was no financial standards to join the union association. I believe there was a nominal registration fee of, I think it was about $10 for each team. So that's that's not enough. That's There's no financial commitment. And so in the preseason, Altoona, the, the, the rumors that they were backed by you know all this money and they claim to have enough money to last several seasons and then it was in six weeks they fold because they've lost so much money and there's no hope of making it back and lucas and some of their other owners they did prop up certain clubs i know um there's significant contributions made to the boston unions club to help keep them going throughout the season um but in other cases teams just folded or, or you know, dropped out when the money ran out or they were so the when the keystones uh philadelphia when they folded in august i think they were about eight or ten thousand dollars in debt um they had lost that much money you know and that's just in about four months of play and so that gives you a sense of where things were and so without that dedicated money behind a team to ensure it keeps going you know that that was a big issue and, and so when you have rich people and you know, uh, very modest, uh, modest ownership groups competing against one another, you just have a huge disparity. All right, so uh, the sixth mistake, I guess we could say, is um, the, the guarantee process. Um, basically, the, the way in which teams were paid off to uh, play their games, uh, basically, for every regular season, for every uh, scheduled contest during the season, the home team was required to pay the visiting team $75, except for the two holiday games that occurred during the season, which were on Decoration Day on May 30th and on uh, July 4th, uh, Independence Day, in which there'd be a 50-50 split of revenue. We know that ticket prices for every club were 25 cents for adults. So that meant you need to have 300 paying fans at a game to cover the guarantee. Um, by my numbers, you need roughly about, teams needed about 1,300 fans per game uh, at home to cover all of the costs, depending on their salaries and things like that. But that's the rough sort of break even point for teams that had attendance higher than 1,300 per game, typically made a bit of money, and teams that didn't, they, they lost money. But there were two problems with this. Um, essentially, that $75 guarantee was pretty steep, actually, for teams that, like the Philadelphia Keystones, which were often having trouble drawing more than 100 fans per game. And so if a tennis was poor, the home team had to pay the guarantee um, out of pocket, out of their savings, whatever, or they might not be able to pay at all. And then the other problem was that regardless of the attendance of the game, no matter how many fans attended, you'd still be getting $75. So the teams that drew well, like St. Louis, drew very well. Um, and also some teams had Sunday contests and those games were often the highest attended games of the season. Uh, for instance, Kansas City Unions, they were averaging 6 to 8,000 fans for their Sunday contests. So say so you show up on Sunday on a Kansas City to 8,000 Rockets fans and you still get the same $75 as when you showed up in Wellington and played for 75 fans. And it meant that there just essentially wasn't a way to redistribute those funds in a way that would support teams and support the the basically long-term kind of um i guess success or stability 
And it also punished home teams that drew poorly because they had to pay out of pocket, but it didn't really incentivize road teams either. So the typical pattern for when a team would fold is they would complete the homestand, trying to recoup whatever cost they could, and then they would just not go on the road trip. And that's what happened with every single team that kind of folded. And so as a result, this, this guarantee kind of was problematic because it didn't really super revenues and it put a tax on, on poor dry teams, on the, on the weaker teams, but also didn't actually address the issue of you know, how to get funds from the, the financially successful teams to the, to the weaker clubs. And this is sort of the rule that appears in the Union Association Constitution. Um, that explains yeah, the, the 75 guarantee for each game as long with the 50-50 split. So state number seven, the Appleton Scotton and the city of Gregory indifference. Um, essentially when the league formed in sort of September 1883, there was a plan that they put a team in New York City. One of the people who was involved in the creation of the league was this guy, James Jackson, who was famously and derisively referred to as a projector. There's all sorts of fun uh, anecdotes about him in the you know, police gazette, in the National Police Gazette, that sort of make fun of his uh, his fast talking and uh, self indulgent kind of personality. And one of the things he claimed was that uh, he had recruited uh, Charles Byrne and the Brooklyn franchise to join the Union Association. And you know this guy refuted it in the papers. And eventually Jackson gets kind of booted pretty early on in the process. So essentially. The Union Association gets shut out of New York and Brooklyn, and that's a big issue because that's a big market. It theoretically could support a team, and also meant that they had to put the club in Altoona to start the season. Which again, New York City versus Altoona in terms of population, in terms of variety of things, probably you know that that's significantly different. But then conversely, is they did put a team in Philadelphia, which was one of the most populous cities in the country uh, in 1884. Um, but it also proved to be a dismal failure because essentially the U Association Club, which is the Philadelphia Keystones, had to compete against the Philadelphia Athletics, who had just won the American Association pennant in 1883 and set an attendance record with like some, I think, about 200,000 fans for the season, as well as a vastly improved Philadelphia club in the National League. And then in 1884, Philadelphia is probably the hotbed of um, baseball in the country in terms of there was this incredibly vibrant semi-pro and amateur scene where there's dozens of games uh, throughout the week and on weekends. And so essentially this Keystones, you know, pretty early on, it's clearly not good. They put up a poor quality of ball. Um, and why would you go see them when you have so many other options? And so despite the population of Philadelphia uh, being large enough in theory to support three teams, there really wasn't any incentive for people to go to uh, go to games in Philadelphia. Uh, and so the Union Association is quickly dies out there. And that's that's a, a woodcut of uh, Tom Pratt, who was uh, the, the owner of the Keystones, as well as uh, Charles H. Bone, who was owner of the Brooklyn American Association Club, which eventually becomes the daughters. So uh, state number eight, uh, those Sunday blues. Um, so when the season starts of the original eight teams in the league, Cincinnati, St. Louis, and Chicago um, agreed to host Sunday games, which was a contentious point well into the 20th century because of uh, local religious uh, groups and those blue laws and things like that that prevented teams from playing on Sunday. It was often a big headache when people, teams tried to do that. Um, but Cincinnati, St. Louis, and Chicago did host Sunday games. The appeal of a Sunday game was that it was the one day that the working class had off and could easily attend games. And those games were often well attended by the fans who did go. But the issue is that the rest of the league did not play, sun did not play Sunday home games. So this created a couple issues in that in terms of scheduling, it was kind of problematic because some teams refused to play Sunday games at all, even if they were visiting. And so then you have to rearrange the schedule and do things like that. And then in the case of Altoona, um, they played a Sunday road game early in the season. And it was believed that uh, the locals in Altoona were so turned off and disgusted by this that they that was one of the reasons why they do so poorly uh, at, at home. I, I think it's a little bit overstated, but 
it was something that came up in the local papers and Spoiler Life talks about it as being a reason why the Altoona faithful did not turn out to support the Altoona Union Club was because of this uh, breach of God's law in, in the plan on Sunday. Um, and the other issue is that the Sunday games benefit the home clubs who could host them. Uh, and so, like I've mentioned before, Kansas City and Milwaukee, when they joined the Union Association, they both also play Sunday games. And Kansas City drew very well, and Milwaukee also drew very well. And a big part of that was these Sunday contests. But again, the issue ends up being that you don't end up um, distributing those funds to the visiting clubs in any meaningful way because it's just a seventy-five dollar guarantee. It's not in the constitution that they have to distribute it differently based on attendance figures, things like that. And so it ends up just being a source of, it's just, it's just an issue that, that ends up sort of plaguing the league throughout, throughout the season. Um, and it, and yeah, the scheduling issues are, are part of that because essentially they'd often have to reschedule games. I think Boston had initially committed to playing Sunday games and then changed their mind. So then they had to redraw the schedule and things like that just create kind of headaches. And so, especially with an odd number of teams that are playing home games uh, on Sundays, it just, yeah, creates some issues. And here's a nice uh, illustration I found of, uh, uh, I believe it's a religious, uh, like a, a pastor or something to that effect uh, and his dream of punishing anyone who decides to do something fun on a Sunday, so. All right, so uh, number nine, um, innovate or die. It's not a great clever title, I guess, but um, essentially the Union Association did very little to distinguish itself from the National League or the American Association. Um, the main things it did do, just basically copied the American Association with 25 cents tickets and playing on Sundays. Uh, I don't believe they sold alcoholic games, uh, to my knowledge, but I've not found anything to, to confirm that or deny that. Um, but it didn't really do anything new or innovative. Whereas the American Association had brought baseball to certain markets and, and had really appealed to working class, um, the Union Association did not really do anything new in that sense. There were a few unique aspects to the Union Association. Notably, the early start to the season, they started on April 17th versus May 1st uh, for the other two leagues as you know, trying to get a head start on the season. Um, the pushback on the reserve rule was kind of unique at the time because for the previous few seasons, it had been sort of progressing forward with uh, both the American Association, the National League, and the Northwestern League all embracing this reserve rule as a means of controlling players, as a means of controlling salaries. Um, but the Union Association kind of uh, was a bit of a spatter of the works in that and, and sort of creates a bit of conflict. Um, they had a specific baseball, um, the Wright and Ditson baseball. Wright and Ditson was the sporting goods company that was owned in part by uh, George Wright, who was also the owner of the Boston Unions. And one, one theory that the reason he joined the Union Association was simply so he could uh, sell his baseballs. And they also produced the, the yearly guide for the Union Association. So it was just an extra sort of income for his sporting goods company. And that's why he agreed to go along with the Union Association. Um, but the baseball was supposedly much harder than the American Association of National League balls, which may have led to increased offense, although it's hard to suss that out given, you know, the general quality of play in the Union Association. Um, and there's also some anecdotes that it increased injuries. So there's people saying that this is breaking people's hands and things like that on line drives. Um, but perhaps the biggest uh, innovation, if you can call it that, is they introduced Major League Baseball to Kansas City um, and they were the first, you know, club to play professionally in Kansas City. And so that's actually, I think, fairly meaningful, uh, given that, you know, the Kansas City Royals and all that sort of stuff have remained one of, you know, uh, baseball's, you know, uh, most memorable franchises in the past, you know, 50 years or so. But yeah, like I said, there's not really a gimmick or originality with the league. It was just kind of, what if we took what everyone was do else was doing and just did it worse? And then, you know, it just, it's, yeah, they, they, they didn't stand out in any meaningful way. And the ways in which they did stand out were typically just how poor quality the play was, or economic, like economic disparity, quality of play disparity, things like that. So it wasn't positive, the things that they contributed uh, versus other leagues. Like if we look historically along like the impact of the Players League or the Federal League, there's definable things that they were doing that sort of we still can talk about. The Youth Association is a little bit trickier to 
so so where his legacy was and even at the time there wasn't anything to distinguish it um, other than that it just wasn't put in this uh, as baseball establishment um, and that's an illustration of the U association ball uh, double cover five and quarter ounces nine inches And then finally, I think the biggest mistake they probably made like for the long-term health was challenging the reserve rule. Um, essentially by trying to poach players from the American Association and the National League and the Northwestern League, uh, they antagonized uh, you know, the most powerful people in the industry. Uh, and this led directly to the weaponization of the reserve rule, which Kind of had great negative consequences going forward for for professional baseball players um who what was called the day resolution and essentially what it meant that if a player jumped the reserve rule if a player left their team it broke the reserve rule um they could now be threatened with suspension or blacklist and and potentially banned from the game you know and so it was a way to instill even more control over players and then also because the union association had targeted uh, players, even the players they didn't sign, uh, there was a lot of rumors around signing guys like like Johnny Wood and Roger Connor and all these sorts of things. They were pursuing players actively. Um, it also led directly to um, the American Association, which particular expanding uh, by four teams to block the Union Association from certain markets. And so, essentially, by you know pursuing the players, they antagonized people who had more money, more resources, and more intent to you know fight back. And so, it made it difficult. And then. It also led to both the American Association and the National League poaching United Association players, Union Association players in response. And so essentially, you know, they took the approach that if they're not going to respect our contracts, we won't respect their contracts. And so again, it creates this whole kind of revolving door kind of situation throughout the season where players are jumping back and forth between teams. Um, and there was, I think, a path forward to if pushing back against the reserve rule, and this was uh, done sort of, I think, pretty effectively by Albert H. Henderson, who is the kind of forgotten owner of the Chicago unions and the Baltimore unions. He owned both clubs. Um, but essentially what he did is he stocked his roster with almost exclusively players from the Northwest Northwestern League. In particular, he targeted Peoria and Springfield franchises and signed about 13 players from those clubs. And those players were on the reserve list. They were part of the tripartite agreement. But what happened is, no one really cared. There wasn't the big outcry and there wasn't really a response from the Northwestern League because these teams didn't have the resources. The media outside of a few locals in, in those particular cities didn't really take up the cause and uh, scream, bloody murder, scream bloody murder, so to speak. Um, and so it ended up being a real strategic way to get some talented players on this club without getting near the negative attention that Lucas got for poaching players from the National League and the American Association. And so that's an image of Albert Henderson. Uh, I think it's from 1925. He was a lifelong Baltimore native um, and had a pretty interesting life that's been unfortunately kind of, you know, lost to history. But uh, hopefully I'll, I'll do some more stuff on him in the future. And I write about him quite a bit in my book as well. And this is an image of one of the contracts he signed with uh, Charles Levis, who was uh, the, the first baseman for his Chicago club, and he'd signed him from Peoria and signed him for the princely sum of $1,200 a month, or $1,200 for the year, so about $200 a month, um, which was kind of the going rate for a middle-of-the-road player uh, in 1884. And so he was able to control his costs, get some talented players, and also didn't get the negative attention that Lucas and company did. So those are kind of the 10 mistakes. And then we can ask, did anything actually work, right? Because ultimately the legacy of the union association is generally it's failure, it's, you know, it's ineptitude, different things like that. Um, but we can point to a few positives, I think. Uh, so St. Louis, Kansas City, Washington, and Milwaukee all turned significant profits. Uh, Milwaukee did so in just a few weeks in the league, but that's because they, played 12 home games, didn't have to go on the road, uh, but they do very well. And so four of the clubs that finished the season turned a profit, uh, Baltimore nearly broke even, but because of the connection with Baltimore and Chicago, they lost money in total, but the, the actual Baltimore club actually did pretty well because they drew pretty well throughout the season. Um, 
And despite the lack of depth in the league, um, every single team in the league fielded at least some major league quality talent. And so if you can look at the example of Altoona, which is which was a terrible club, six weeks, won six games. But the shortstop was Joe Benny Smith, who was probably the best defensive shortstop of the 19th century. Uh, and the Wilmington franchise, which joined for the Eastern League and had a disastrous hit where they went two, two and 16 and then folded, you know, less than a month after they had joined, uh, they had Oyster Bones and they had uh, the Casey brothers and they had the only Nolan on the club. And so it's not like even, even the worst clubs in the league still had some major league quality talent. And so that's something we can point to that, that every single club produced something, someone who went on to like a lengthy major league career. Um, one, one thing that, as I learned more about the Union Association that was very surprising was we know the story that St. Louis joins the National League in 1885, but we also found, I also found that both Washington, Kansas City, and Milwaukee also kept their franchise intact and Washington joined the Eastern League and won the pennant in the, uh, in the Eastern League that year. Kansas City and Milwaukee joined the Western League, which formed out the ashes of the Union Association and even the Boston Unions uh basically formed reformed again and then saw a play in the i think it's the eastern massachusetts state league uh sort of they moved to newburyport i believe and then uh to biddeford is a bit complicated but so five five teams from the union association saw a play in 1885 in different various leagues um and then st louis and then Kansas City and Washington both maintained the same ownership group and some of the same players from 1885 to 1886, and both those teams were accepted into the National League. And so uh, it's, a, a, it's a bit of a stretch, but I would say three of these teams ended up in the, in the National League. Uh, two of them you know, did it in a much different way than Henry Lucas did, but I think that's like an interesting legacy to consider. So then we ask, what could they have done differently? How could they have been a contender? You know, I think ultimately having the owners on the same page, having every market kind of pursuing things with the intent that we're trying to make the league succeed, not simply just each individual team. And no, that's a difficult thing to do. Um, and in 884, that probably wouldn't be the kind of thing that anyone but the most progressive of thinkers would be able to uh, communicate or pursue. But that was that would have been the thing that needed to happen in order to for it to in order for it to succeed. Um, they could have recruited from the Northwestern League, like Henderson did, and signed other various free agents. Um, that way, you kind of keep a low profile um, and you not don't antagonize the major league clubs. Um, finding a way to ensure competitive balance that players are distributed fairly and evenly throughout the league. Uh, figure out ways to ensure that the quality of play is high enough. Or at least evenly matched enough that the results are entertaining, um, and you can hopefully have a pennant race. Hopefully, have multiple teams competing, you know, in in the same kind of stratosphere to try and have, you know, a, a well maintained, well balanced kind of season. Pooling resources. This is something they already kind of did, but something more systematic would have been better um, in terms of uh, essentially making sure that every team has money to finish the season is able to complete all their games, has money to acquire players, has money to uh, make any sort of changes or adjustments, renovations, buy equipment, et cetera, that, so that teams don't fold during the season because that is ultimately the thing that ends up looking the worst is if, you know, when we look at the Union Association, it started with eight teams, it finished with eight teams, but 12 different teams played in the league and there was in 13 cities. And so it's, you know, that's that doesn't reflect well on its, stability, et cetera. And so finding some way to pool those resources. Um, also, I would, they should have avoided small markets. Altoona was a mistake, um, despite whatever hopes and dreams and wishes people had for it to succeed. It's just too small a market to compete um, by 1884. And they probably realistically, in lieu of Altoona, they probably should have just done a 16 circuit. It, the, the logic behind doing an 18 circuit is the scheduling was easier, the travel was easier. Uh, but if you have too many franchises that can't support themselves, it, it doesn't bode well for the health of the league. And so they probably should just send six teams, started small, 
go bigger. This was the American Association did. They did six teams to start, and then they sort of evolved um, and added teams as they could split them. Uh, I think they should have changed the guarantee to a revenue split. So either do $75 as a minimum, along with a 50-50 split, depending on how the attendance is. And that way, funds get redistributed. That way, uh, teams are incentivized to complete the road trips, to show up for games, and essentially that the money goes from the rich to the poor, and everyone kind of has some incentive to participate in the league. Um, and they should have just focused on growing the league and not on the external stuff. Like one of the things Lucas did that was problematic is he would, en would engage in war words with the established major leagues. He was often very concerned about how he was perceived, how the league was perceived, and um, trying to curry attention and, and, and get people to pay attention to what he was doing and often choosing controversy over stability. Um, and so that probably was a mistake because, you know, he, he didn't have the, the wherewithal or mindset to kind of maintain, I guess, a sense of confidence or stability or determination in face of that. So when, when things went bad, he very quickly folded. Um, and so, yeah, I think focusing on the growing the league rather than worrying about what everyone else is doing probably would have been the way to go. And then, so we asked ourselves, could they have made it through the 1885 season? Um, so essentially they died in January 1885 when Henry Lucas joined the National League. He didn't show up to the, the scheduled union association meeting and that kind of killed the league. Um, the Western League formed almost immediately after that happened. Uh, and that was the closest analog to what the Union Association would have been because they there'd been discussions in November, December, and into January with Lucas involved of what uh, the Union Association would look like in 1885. And it was a fully planned to become a Western only association. So they would put clubs in Detroit and Cleveland and they'd get rid of all the East Coast franchises and solely focus on being a Western, a Western league, so to speak. Um, but we know that in 1885, the Western League, they folded by the end of June. Uh, they didn't have the money or resources to prop up uh, the struggling clubs. The markets were kind of too small. Um, and so, yeah, without the, without the resources of Lucas and Henderson and Bowden, who were both all quite wealthy and put lots of money into keeping the league afloat, um, the league yet yeah, folded quite quickly. So there is a version of the Union Association I think if you had Lucas and Porter on board um, with their money and commitment to putting uh, the best team on the field, et cetera, it might have been sustainable, but that's something that obviously didn't happen. And so we don't know exactly what would have happened. Um, but it's pretty clear that like there was too much baseball in 1884. There were too many teams. There wasn't enough players to support a uh, high quality of play. Um, you look at now and there's, Pretty major league teams, a bunch of minor league clubs, and you're drawing players from all over the world, but you still run into like there's not enough talented baseball players, you know, to, to succeed at a major league quality level. And so 1884, that problem was exacerbated drastically by the fact that virtually every player in the league was from a small section of the northeastern United States. And so I think going into 1885, the, the approach would have been to kind of do what every other successful league ended up doing um, that eventually had like started up as a rival league and eventually, you know, lasted would be to look to merge, right? Like the American Association, the American Football League, American Basketball Association, the World Hockey Association, all of those leagues formed to rival the major league, the established major league and their success End up happening because they they merged clubs you know from the from the one league became strong enough that they could join the established league and that's kind of the that's the pathway to success that's been happened anytime it's anytime there's been any sort of uh rivalries like this where you have multiple leagues competing for fan attention ultimately the the senior league typically wins out and they take the best of the 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 startup with them um and it, there's also a third real problem. Every single time, uh, 1884, 1890, and, and 1914, 1915, when there's been a third league, 
the, the two established leagues join forces to fight them off. And so that's just something that was inherent to, to the Union Association's long-term success is the fact that no matter what they did, they were going to be fighting against two leagues that didn't want them around. And there wasn't really a great way to navigate that. So conclusion, um, too much baseball. I've discussed that. Uh, the league was in peril from opening day. There wasn't really, there was always going to be issues of like, how long will they last? What teams are going to stick around? From the start, from the moment Altoona stepped on the field, it was pretty clear that this isn't going to work. Um, and there's no guarantee they would have lasted 1885, even if Lucas stays on board, even if they decide to do it again, there's just no guarantee they would have because it was really tough to make money in baseball. Uh, it's still tough to make money in baseball outside of being you know, a billionaire owner, uh, but it was very tough at that point in time to make money in baseball because you're relying solely on ticket sales, you're relying on a bunch of things that are in control. Um, and so, yeah, it just, there's no guarantee they would have lasted. And we see what happens in 1890 and 1914, 1915, um, when there's three major leagues, you know, it just, it doesn't work out for one of them. Um, and there probably is a version of the Union Association that could have succeeded uh, beyond 1884, uh, but it would require a cohesive vision, ample resources, and a willingness to share and distribute the resources. And, you know, that's just something that most people don't have the foresight to do. Uh, and getting, you know, eight wealthy people to agree to take, take a financial hit, you know, for the long-term growth of the league, that's something that generally people don't do. Uh, and so even nowadays, that'd be difficult to communicate that vision to people, uh, let alone 1884, when there was just so much more uh, financial risk and so much more likelihood of failure. And so, yeah, so I, I don't think there's a great chance it could have succeeded in 1885, but there, there might've been, you know, if you had the right people involved in that sort of thing. So, um, that sort of concludes the talk. Uh, if you have any questions outside of what we might do in the chat here, you can always email me. I'm pretty active on Twitter as well. So uh, I guess with that, I will conclude the presentation. So. Thank you, Jake. Yeah, Justin, we appreciate uh, a lot of information there right? not on a league that's not quite real well known. We have a number of questions. If you could okay. turn your slides uh, off, hit escape, and then just X out your slides. We'll get back to the okay. gallery. Um, yeah, so I'll just stop sharing the screen. Would you yeah. Good? yeah, and I'm going to reclaim uh, yes. the host, and that way we can uh, move forward with a good number of uh, questions that we have waiting here. Okay. Uh, and uh, Woody uh, Eckert starts off with uh, uh, we were talking about the eight teams in the uh, uh, Union Association said that the American Association had successfully entered with just six teams. I think you talked about that at the at the end yeah. of your talk. Would they, and he later on says, would they have been better? Uh, essentially says they should have dropped Altoona in Philadelphia. Yeah. I, I, would that have been smart? And are those the teams to go? Obviously, Altoona was a weak sister. Yeah. Philadelphia is the second or third largest market in the country. Yeah. So, so the thing with Philadelphia is going into the season, there's this strange thing that happens with both Philadelphia and Boston, in which Boston joins the league officially on March 17th. And so they have less than a month to build a ballpark and find players to fill, put on their team, whereas, whereas Philadelphia had joined the league in September. And they both take this hybrid approach of we'll fill out a team with all veterans that people will recognize who played here. So Philadelphia signs like Le Levi Merrily and Fergie Malone and folks like that who had you know not played regularly in a long, long time. And Boston has Tim Moname and Lou Brown and Tommy Bond on their club. Uh, and essentially, and then they fill the rest of the roster with local young talent. So Boston has Tommy McCarthy and uh, Ed Crane and, and uh, Philadelphia has Jack Clements and some like some actual talented players. Um, but going into the season, people are predicting Philadelphia is going to be one of the best teams in the league. Like you can find out, oh, they're going to be heavy hitters. They're going to do all this sort of stuff. And they have a, they signed Buck Weaver uh, from Louisville. He'd won 20 games. You have a pitcher, all sort of stuff. 
Um, and so both teams were kind of expected to be competitive, uh, but then Philadelphia was thought to be one of the favorite teams, like, but then very early on, they, they, they were very bad. And so there's no incentive for anyone to go see the games, but I don't think, basically the owner Tom Pratt had money and the club, you know, seemed like it could be good on paper uh, and it makes sense to put team in, in the large market. So I, I think realistically, we know, you know, Altoona definitely was a mistake from the start. Philadelphia also proved to be a mistake. Uh, I think the six team circuit would have been the way to go if you don't have two good franchises. But the, the irony is that Philadelphia was thought to be one of the stable franchises and Boston okay. actually okay. actually was the last team to join and had less than a month to, to get everything together. And yet they lasted the whole season. Philadelphia sounds a lot like the 62 Mets, every old Dodger they can add. That's exactly it. Yeah, yeah, it's fascinating. Uh, yeah, yeah. But uh, Mike Hopper uh, asked, uh, and there's a comment came right after that. Uh, speaking uh, of imbalance within the union association, he, he, he equates, I'd say you could uh, say the same thing about the Yankees in the, from the, I guess, the 20s to the, to the 50s and early 60s. And John Gregory uh, reacted to that, saying uh, you could construct a metric for what we mean by imbalance. And some seasons and leagues will be higher than others. But wouldn't the 1884 Union League Association be off the charts for imbalance? Yeah, I mean, I, I think knowing what we know, uh, yeah, I think you have to kind of look at it a certain way. Um, it is quite imbalanced, very top heavy. Um, by the end of the year, you basically have Cincinnati when they signed Jack Craskock and Jim McCormick and, and Fatty Priori from Cleveland in August, they went on this really good run. So by the end of the year, both Cleveland, both St. Louis and Cincinnati are actually pretty closely matched, uh, but the pennant race has already been decided. Um, and then, yeah, the instability of teams. So the Altoona, the Wilmington experiment was a disaster. Um, Kansas City and Washington were both very tumultuous, but oddly very profitable financially. Uh, so yeah, I, I think, yeah, that's hard to argue that there's anything, they, they are very, there, there's a really large amount of competitive imbalance that happens in 1884 in that league, but this is also a feature of other leagues. So maybe your association is the highest, I'm not sure. You can quite find some national, national association, depending on how you feel about it as a major league. There's definitely some of that same imbalance, but in the same year in 1884, the, the Washington Statesman um, of the American Association they go 12 and 51 and they fold as well. And, you know, <laughs> they actually get beat out by the Washington Nationals for the fan attention and that sort of thing. So I think there's, you know, this is a, a feature of, of it. But yeah, I would say it, it is, I, I would not argue against that claim that it's maybe the most uh, imbalanced of any sort of major league season. Uh, but it's also a thing that happens in other leagues and other seasons as well. So. Mike Halpert also asked that, it, it, what was the rationale for the uh, home teams paying $75 to road clubs? And did that even cover traveling costs, let alone anything else? Yeah, like, I mean, essentially it's just a means to, because in terms of income, you're basically without TV rights, without uh, marketing, with all those things, you're essentially just ticket sales are the sole source of income other than recruiting locals to buy shares in the team. And so the 75 guarantee, dollar guarantee, I'm not sure what the American Association and National League were doing at that time, but it was essentially just to ensure that um, road teams showed up for the game because they're, they're going to get paid. Because this is an issue. If, if you show up to a game and you don't get paid. It's like, well, why would you keep showing up to games, right? <laughs> uh, and so, yeah, that was that was essentially it. But it just essentially, um, I saw this thing. I think there was a write up in the, one of the Philadelphia papers in uh, talking about the costs. Basically, a team would need to draw thirteen hundred fans a game with like a sort of typical union association salary list to cover the costs for a game, and so. That was sort of the idea is that um, you want to make sure that the home team, like home teams join well enough that they can pay out the guarantee. And then that guarantee will also help to cover the costs for the team that's traveling. Um, but you're also banking on that the, that team, when they're at home, they're also going well enough. And that's something that 
just didn't happen. And so that's why the guarantee was kind of problematic is that it tried to do one thing, but kind of penalized the teams that couldn't draw well and didn't really help them either in any way. Like that, that money isn't enough to keep you going when at home you can't draw. And then you also have to pay that out to the club. I know the National League went back and forth between a guarantee and we're splitting the gates and yeah, we're splitting, yeah, yeah. or splitting the gates on holidays or something of that nature. But by the time they get to the 1890s, there's the four teams they have fun to throw out. They're always complaining that they can't even make their expenses going yeah. into the Louisville, Washington, Baltimore, and Cleveland. Yeah. Uh, uh, Peter Mancuso and Mike Halpert have kind of related uh, questions. You're talking about uh, a poaching of, of players. Uh, uh, Peter asked, uh, were any of the those posts from the uh, Union Association eventually become uh, big names or regular players in uh, uh, the major leagues? And, and my guess, uh, were Union Association players jumping between other Union Association clubs? Were they robbing each other? Was it just a cutthroat uh, sort of situation or were they just revolving between leagues? Uh, no, the, it was simply revolving between leagues. Like there wasn't, pe there wasn't situations where where union association clubs were stealing from each other. If players ended up on other teams, it's usually either through an agreement. Um, in like St. Louis provided some of the players from the reserve club to join Kansas City to help them kind of be able to field the team because Kansas City basically joined. They they have to form a team within a week. Like they don't, they, they go from not existing to being on the field within a week uh, in, in June. Um, so yeah, with, with that, like there wasn't, within the league, there was generally not any contracts were respected. Uh, in terms of uh, other teams poaching, so the, fame, the, the best case would be in Wilmington, because the minute Wilmington leaves the Eastern League and joins the, the Union Association, Progressive Baseball basically considers the contracts like null and void because they now sign new union association contracts. And so within two games, um, Oyster Bones and Dennis Casey are signed by Baltimore to the, the Baltimore Orioles uh, in the American Association. So they steal those, both those guys. And, both, and Oyster Bones went on to have a really nice career in Major League Baseball. Um, and then Dennis Casey also had a decent career as well. And so those, those guys are the kind of two big ones. Um, another famous one is Billy Taylor, who was the star pitcher for, the, for St. Louis. Uh, midway through the season, he was famously kind of an alcoholic and, and uh, a pretty wild character. And uh, basically when Lucas refuses to advance him some money, he signs with the Philadelphia Athletics uh, in, in July. And that's what necessitates St. Louis having to find a new pitcher. And that's what causes them to go after initially old Hoss Radboard and then eventually they signed Charlie Sweeney because they've lost their starting pitcher to the American Association. Uh, let me uh, uh, close. Uh, we, uh, there are a number of other, we could go on for another another hour probably, but uh, 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 John Pregler uh, asked uh, about the role of Ted Sullivan in the founding of the league. Uh, uh, he, he John says that, that uh, Sullivan was a guy who built the St. Louis team for Lucas, uh, like he did for Vondra season or two seasons uh, before that. Uh, but did he also play some uh, uh, role in developing the league as a whole? Yeah, so essentially he's brought in by Lucas. I think he represents Lucas at one of the first meetings when Lucas isn't, has been named yet. Uh, and yeah, Sullivan, through his various travels is it's a really fascinating character. But yeah, he he essentially leaned heavily on Sullivan to find players, to pick out players. He even when Sullivan's in New Orleans in 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 the winter of that year, he signs a couple of local players to join the play for the team and stuff. And so he's very involved with um helping Lucas out develop his team. And then um, he manages St. Louis for the first part of the year. I think when they're 29 and four, he ends up uh, having a dispute with Fred Dunlap over baseball strategy or whatever. And so he actually quits the team. And then he buys into the Kansas City Club and takes that over and then remodels that into uh, a very profitable team. Like he, he, he churns through players and just is constantly just 
trying to find the cheapest people available. If he finds anyone who they ain't good, he signs them to no, some okay money. But that team ends up doing really well financially because they it's novel, it's exciting, it's fun, even though the team stinks. But Sullivan also has a real knack for you know finding cheap players and and you know just being he's 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 a pretty talented businessman, so to speak. So he he wasn't involved with the formation of the league so much, but he did really help Lucas and the St. Louis Club develop. And then later he's he's the reason Kansas City kind of um, is able to endure the 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 difficult kind of schedule they have because they they're not a very good club, but his support and his willingness to just turn through players. And even in the offseason when the when the Union Association is planning to play in 1885, he had signed uh, several players like like he flying Dupi Shaw from Boston. He's going to be the start pitcher for Kansas City in the Union Association eighty five. Like he was, he saw a real opportunity in Kansas City. So, Justin, thank you. We appreciate your uh, My pleasure. presentation and uh, uh, this little interchange here. Uh, a couple of questions we we didn't get to. You can reach Justin by uh, the email he put up. Uh, earlier, if you didn't copy it down, it's on the Sabre website and uh, in the membership directory. You get in touch with him or track him down on Twitter when he's doing something nasty over there. Uh, uh, the, uh, the the question revolves around the the Union Association being a major league or being declared a major league mm -hmm. into the what 1969 or something when the, when that uh, became official. And then also the idea of just what is a major league. And finally, there was a question about uh, uh, from Woody Eckert on St. Louis merging into the National League and the question of did, did uh, Lucas have these ulterior motives uh, uh, to start with and he really wasn't that committed to the Union Association. I don't have time to get into that now, but thank you. And you can reach uh, 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 Justin at his uh, uh, Twitter account or on the uh, 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 email from the uh, uh, Sabre directory. Peter, if you would like to close us up here. Yes, well, first, Justin, I want to say that you are Mr. UA now. <laughs> uh, I was I was keeping track of the questions and, uh, you know, I hope that you answer those questions for those individuals. There's some really uh, intriguing questions in there. And it's very, uh, it was very comprehensive. Like I, I couldn't get over how well thought out uh, you were in approaching this topic all the way, not only the 10 most, you know, 10 worst problems, but the uh, the idea of, you know, what they might have done, you know, to make it different. So thank you again. Oh, yeah, thank you. This has been wonderful. And thank you all for attending and for all the questions. And yeah, feel free to get in touch. I'm always happy to discuss the Union Association uh, till my face turns blue. So uh, thank you so much <laughs> once again for this wonderful opportunity. Okay, our next piece of business is, is just uh, say reminder that next Tuesday, uh, next month on the second Tuesday, October the 11th, uh, we're going to have Gary Gillette do a presentation on the on the what he terms the true triple crown of 19th century baseball. In other words, what were the most important stats of the 19th century that we, you know, have come to regard uh, as different stats in a way for what becomes the triple crown in 20th century baseball? So uh, I think Gary will have a very interesting presentation. And again, that's on. October the 11th, that's uh, coming up. Uh, I do also want to mention two other things. Uh, <clears throat> we have an outstanding, outstanding program. Uh, Len Levin is well aware of this. because <laughs> It was the Rhode Island uh, chapter really put this program together. And they have uh, on November the 12th, we're doing the Southern New England uh, 19th Century Baseball Symposium. Uh, the complete details of which uh, are on the Sabre website, also in our uh, last newsletter, which was our summer issue uh, of our newsletter. And it's about to appear again uh, at the end of this month in our uh, October issue, uh, of our, uh, which is the fall issue of our newsletter. So 
I hope you, anybody uh, tuned in here that's in the striking distance of Rhode Island uh, will uh, join us there. It's a really intriguing program. You'd be amazed at some of who the presenters are. Uh, also, <laughs> I'd like to mention that we're coming up on our uh, Project Ivor Campbell 19th Century Baseball Research Presentation deadline, which is October 31st. So anyone interested in uh, uh, submitting a research presentation, again, uh, I just sent out a, a message to 19th Century Committee members reminding them of uh, what the abstract should look like and when the deadline is, October 31st. Uh, Bob, I wanna thank you again for uh, mustering all this together and uh, what can I say, it was a, uh, you know, very, very entertaining evening. Thank and you. And informative. Looking forward to next month. Good night, all. Thank you again.